this is a session of, um, of African languages, African cultures within the School of Languages, Cultures and Linguistics. Um, we have a packed program. I think we only have 45 minutes and I have a little presentation just to give you an idea of what studying a SOAS is like and the stuff we discuss within the African languages, and African cultures. Um, then we can do a little bit of playing with, the, with Swahili. I have a little Swahili taste uh, just, just from the textbook we use. Um, and um, also Alice is here. She is a student of Swahili. She is in Kenya at the moment, actually, so she can probably more, speak more, more authoritatively than I can. Um, and then we leave a bit of time at the end for questions as well. Um, and as Amani has said, if there's anything in between, just put it in the chat and then um, we, can, we can take it from there. Um, I'm going to share my screen because I have a PowerPoint presentation. Uh, you will probably not be surprised to hear, um, which is here and I'm going to get off the panels. I'll leave the chat on actually, so you can see if there's anything in between, please put it in the chat, it should work okay. Um, good, and then I move that about so I can see as well. Um, yes, um, so my name is Lutz Martin. I am in the Africa section of the um, School of Languages, Cultures and Linguistics. I'm also half in the linguistic section. So my interest is in African languages in particular. Um, East African languages. I started with Swahili, and I already noticed that many of you are interested in Swahili, um, and then worked more, more widely in Zambia, Namibia, and recently also we started work in collaboration with uh, um, Bayero University in Kano in northern Nigeria. Um, and I'm going to talk you a little bit through, if I may. Ah, first of all, welcome to the SOAS Virtual Open Day at the School of Languages, Cultures and Linguistics. Um, and this is a little picture. I put in some pictures just to make it a bit more lively. This is, again, some of you will know that uh, the ferry ride from Dar es Salaam to Zanzibar, um, and there's still Daos going up and down, which is historically very, very significant, significant also for the spread of Swahili. So if you study the history of Swahili, maritime trade is really, really important. Um, so I'm very, very fond of that, that picture. But of course, there's modern ferries also you can see in the background. Um, so I briefly want to talk about SOAS and, and the School of Languages, Cultures, Linguistics, then have a brief background on African languages. Um, and then two more specific case studies, if you like. Um, I want to talk about language and identity based on um, Half of a Yellow Sun, the novel by uh, Chimamanda Adichie, um, who many of you will have read. Um, and then a little bit on learning on Afri of African languages, and that, that leads nicely then into um, the Swahili taster. Um, Good, so as highlights, we have 100 years or 104, I think by now, uh, years of scholarship focusing on Africa and Asia. There's over 30 languages with, which are taught within the school. Uh, we have a national research library, one of only five in the country and ours is specialized, of course, uh, for collections relating to Africa and Asia. Um, we have students and staff from over 130 countries. So it's a very international mix. It's a very diverse student population. Um, in terms of you know, people's background, ethnicity, languages. Um, and that for many students, I think is part of the student experience. Um, and of course we have expertise in some of the world's key regions. This, many of our regions are, are where things are happening, if you like at the moment. Um, the School of Languages, Cultures and Linguistics focuses on Africa, uh, which we are focused on, on today, but also the near the Middle East. So we have Arabic as well, South Asia, Southeast Asia, and we have also linguistics and translation, I should add. And um, there's another department within source for East Asian languages and cultures doing Chinese, Japanese, and Korean. And we work very closely together. So there's, there's many links with that as well. Um, and there's also young languages and cultures. We have history department, politics department, development studies, uh, music, um, arts, art and archeology. span um, and all these, all these subjects are available to you through different um, study degrees. Um, so in SLCL, we house the BA Languages and Cultures, and that is either a self-standing full degree, or you can combine that, the BA Languages and Cultures with something else. Uh, we have a BA Linguistics with, um, with a combination, and we have Arabic as well. And the other thing I put, I can put that in the chat later, we have a very neat, I think, very nice uh, series we did when the lockdown started last year, which is called Language for Lockdown, which is just short videos on the different languages, languages we have. So you're welcome to have a look at that as well. Um, uh, within SLCL, we, we focus on literature, film, cultures, and languages. We have a focus on Africa, of course, but also on Africa in a wider global context. That, that's important to us. Um, we have a strong commitment to decolonizing education. That's a big agenda for us at the moment um, it, within the school and within SLCL and the wider source community. Um, we have strengthened translation of African languages. That's another key element. We have 
lots of people doing translation, including Swahili, which is our biggest language, I think, in students' numbers. Um, and the languages we teach in the department at the moment, Amharic, Swahili, Yoruba, and Zulu. And we also, in principle, do house and Somali, but that's because of COVID. Uh, that is paused at the moment. Um, good, a little bit of background on African languages. Um, this is a picture from Zambia, and you can see that in the, the, it's a mobile phone company, and they say 72 languages, 72 ethnic languages, actually, um, on one network, our network. So there's a, there's a pride in linguistic diversity, which is more recent, maybe. We wouldn't have gotten that maybe just after independence. And that's something which is really exciting in studying African languages. Um, this is just a bit of um, um, demographic background, number background. So this is the number of the world's languages, and there are about 7,000 languages in the world. Um, and you know, there's problems with counting, but as a ballpark figure, that's probably okay. Um, and of those, about 2,000 are spoken in Africa. So Africa is very language rich, if you like. That's about a third of the world's languages. And um, the other third is spoken, or another third is spoken in, in Asia. Um, this is a map representation. I'm just showing that every little orange dot on the map represents a language. And you can see that the language diversity of Africa is, is clustered in the center of the continent. So Nigeria, Cameroon, and in the corner in West Africa, also Tanzania, Kenya are very rich. And then there's less diversity maybe if you go further north and further south. Um, a little bit of historical background during the colonial period, African languages experienced marginalization, suppression and negative attitudes that was part of the wider cultural colonial enterprise. Um, and then after independence, many African countries adopted a one language policy um, often promoting English or French. So sometimes you still hear people talk about Anglophone Africa and Francophone Africa, which they, you know, they, of course there's, there's, there's some reason to it, but on the other hand, it's misleading because mostly English and French are just one language amongst many others. Um, and I think people have moved away from that a little bit. So then the 21st century has seen the onset of what is sometimes called an African language renaissance, so the revalorization of African languages. Um, South Africa has now 11 national languages. Uganda has a very progressive um, language policy they call main area languages. Um, Ethiopia and the move to federalism again promoted multilingualism. So you have across the continent a development of multilingual policy <clears throat> in education and public discourses. Um, and you also have the birth of new varieties. So if you're familiar with East Africa, you, you will know Sheng, uh, which you know, people say comes from Swahili, Swahili and English, so a mi mixture. Uh, but that's a new urban variety. It started out maybe as a, as a youth language, uh, but it's now very widely spoken. In Nigeria, there's Niger or Pidgin. And in Southern Africa, people talk about translanguaging, bringing different language together in a new creation. Um, and I have examples here, um, if I may, I may. Um, the BBC now has a pigeon, uh, BBC News has a pigeon series. So they, there's news in pigeon geared towards the Nigerian market and the, the diaspora communities, of course. And um, that's on the top uh, left there. Then at the bottom left, this is the African Academy of Languages. It's a branch of the African Union, um, Akalan. They are very active in the middle, a book of a colleague of ours who has now just moved to Kenyatta University in, in Kenya, um, on Sheng, the um, Swahili vernacular courses in Kenya. Um, and on the right, just, uh, just a, a picture of one, one of the you know, outstanding language activists in the African context, Neville Alexander, um, who promoted multilingual education in, in South Africa, and he passed away a few years ago. Um, this is just Swahili again, because it's important to us, and, and in the, in the, there's lots of things to be said. So this is Swahili in the 21st century. You can see how vibrant it is. So on the, on the left hand side is again a mobile phone adverb, Lura ye to Fahari ye to our language, our pride. You can see the link here between language and national identity in Tanzania, very strong, interesting topic to study. Then in the middle one, this is in, in, in the um, campus of the University of Nairobi in, in Kenya. Um, it's a, an advert for, for an ATM, a cash machine, in partly in Sheng, partly in Swahili and partly in English. Um, on the top right, that's uh, Yomo Kenyatta Airport with bilingual signage. You can see Swahili and English there. Um, and at the bottom right, that's a colleague of ours, Clara Momanyi, who is addressing there's an annual many several annual conferences but this is one of the it's the it's the um the annual kiswahili conference of the of the of the kenyan kiswahili association so you can see how rich the discourses on language is at the moment um i briefly want to talk about language and identity 
uh, because it's important to, to many things we do. Um, and I want to focus on Shimamanda Adichie or Ngozi Adichie, um, in part because she is an honorary fellow of SOA. So the top right hand side corner shows Chimamanda um, and she is working after the SOAS graduation ceremony when she became an honorary fellow. So, so we are close to her in a sense. Um, but you will be familiar with she is a very, very famous author by now. Uh, Purple Hibiscus and Half of a Yellow Sun are the two big early novels which she is famous with. And I want to focus on Half of a Yellow Sun where um, the lead character Olana uses Ibo to claim ethnic and political identity to confront the negative attitudes of a man she sits next to on a plane journey from Kano to, Kano to Lagos in 1966. Um, and that's a bit of a long text, but I want to share that with you. Um, so we are in Nigeria, we are in the, in the mid 1960s. Uh, the political situation is tense. We're just, just before the Biafra war. And that's a plane journey. And of course, people traveling on the plane at that time, you can see also there's a particular social element with these are quite well off people um, flying from Kano to Lagos in the north of the country. I've given you blue notes here in the north of Kano and then back to the main biggest city, Lagos. Um, and then Adichie writes that Olana, the main character, left on Saturday. The man sitting next to her on the plane across the aisle had the shiniest, darkest ebony complexion she had ever seen. She had noticed him earlier in his three-piece wool suit, staring at her as they waited on the tarmac. Um, he had offered to help her with the carry-on bag and later has asked the flight attendant whether he could take the seat next to hers um, since it was vacant. Um, he offered her the new Nigeria and asked, would you like to read this? He wore a large opal ring on his middle finger. Yes, thank you, Olana took the paper. She skimmed through the pages, aware that he was watching her and that the newspaper was a way of starting conversation. Suddenly she wished she could, uh, she could be attracted to him, that something mad and magical would happen to them both. And when the plane landed, she would walk away with her hand in his into a new bright life. She has relationship problems. She is not in good terms with her boyfriend at the time. So that's partly why she went to Kano. So there's, there's an, 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 an emotional romantic element to it as well, but nothing happens to that as you can see in a moment. Um, so then the man says, they have finally removed the evil vice chancellor from the University of Lagos, he said. Oh, it's on the back cover. Olana turned to the back cover, I see. Why should an evil man be the vice chancellor in Lagos, Lagos? He asked, and when Olana said nothing, only half smiling to show she was listening, he added, the problem with evil people is that they want to control everything in this country, everything. Why can't they stay in their east? They own all the shops, they control the civil service, even the police. If you are arrested for any crime, as long as you can say Keda, they will let you go. We say Kedu, not Keda, Olana said quietly. It means, how are you? The man stared at, stared at her and she stared back and thought how beautiful he would have been if he had been a woman with a perfectly shiny near black skin. Are you Igbo, he asked, yes. But you have the face of a, Ful a Fulani people, he sounded accusing. Olana shook her head, ah, Igbo. The man mumbled something that sounded like sorry before he turned away and began to look through the blue briefcase. When she handed the paper back to him, he seemed reluctant to take it. And although she glanced at him from time to time, his eyes did not meet hers again until they landed in Lagos. So what I want to do with that is, I think this is really nice because um, the background is that we have a very political tense situation. That's 1960s Nigeria. We have the Bafraba coming 67 to 71, um, in which the main evil speaking Southeast attempts to gain independence from the rest of Nigeria and then fails. So, so that's the end of the war, but this is before. Um, but then here in this, in this context, Olana uses language to position herself in the specific space of the 1960s Nigerian political discourse. Correcting his evil greeting, but he gets it wrong, she claims identity, linguistic identity and cultural ethnic identity, and creates distance to him by correcting him. So we say Kedu, not Keda. And so the language here corrects the man's mistaken idea about her ethnic identity, which was based on her physical appearance. And, and the example shows nicely, I think that language here is a powerful means to negotiate and express different identities. So this is something, it's just a small example, but this is something which, which we are quite keen to explore you know, in the program in different contexts, how language relates to all kinds of different aspects of human life. And in this particular case of, of ethnic and political identity. Um, good, um, I want to move on to learning African language. That's my second case. Let me check for the time, I think we're okay. 
Um, so this is just a general reasons for learning languages, the three C's they sometimes call it. Um, so there's cognitive one, see cognitive, pedagogic um, and pedagogic reasons um, for language education. So bilingual and multilingual learners have cognitive advantages. There's been long discussion about it, but by and that's learning languages is good for your thinking, I guess. Um, and knowing several languages increases interpersonal and intercultural competence. Um, then if you go down to the right, or if you move to the right, and there's cultural, so that's, that's the second C, cultural identity and social cohesion reasons. Um, so language serves as, as an important vehicle of cultural identity. We've just seen that. Um, language embodies cultural wisdom. Um, so many, you will have seen there's lots of discourse on language endangerment in the moment, you know, over the last couple of years. And people are really worried that with the, with the loss of languages, we also lose cultural wisdom um, and cultural diversity. Um, and acknowledgement and promotion of multilingual realities increases social cohesion. So there's also a real social development aspect to it maybe. And then finally, this, the third C is commercial, political and business reasons, understanding of and better interaction with different global societies, politics and markets works on the basis of speaking different languages. Um, so I have a quote here, actually it's an alleged quote, it's not quite clear where it's from, but I, many people are still using it, including me, um, from Nelson Mandela, the, the South African independence leader and then first president. Um, and he allegedly said, he says something along those lines, at least. Um, if you speak to a man in the spirit of the time, a person, he means. If you speak to a person in a language they understand, you speak to their head. If you speak to a person in their own language, you speak to their heart. So this, this you know, if you like, dichotomy between the language of aspiration and, and social advancement and the language of identity and social cohesion, that's really quite, quite important in many different contexts. And again, it's another reason for, for language learning. Um, and the, the other reason I want to focus on now is that, that what, what we call sometimes expanding your world. So each language contains its own semantic and epistemic system. So the way we structure the world, think about it, relate to each other, in part is, is related to language. So different ways of seeing and analyzing the world around us different categories and expressions to come to term with our shared human experience and different histories and cultural memory, memories. So learning a different language now helps us to understand these systems different from the ones we are used to. Through this, we are better equipped to understand our shared experience, but actually also ourselves. Um, and there, I have one example here from my own language learning experience, which goes back quite some time. So 1994, which is probably yeah, me before you guys were around. In 1994, I started learning Ochierero, a language of Namibia, I have a map just now, um, under the tutelage of Professor Yo Kuakavari, who wasn't a professor at the time, we were, we were both students at SOAS. Um, but he taught me, and then we con continued working together for a very long time, we are still in contact. Um, and one of the things that he taught me, I learned were numbers. Um, so this is a background on Ochierero. So this, uh, the pictures are what it looks like. It's Northern Namibia, you can see it's very arid. Uh, it's very deserty, but there is also water, there's cattle, so, so there's it's lively communities. And there on the map, it shows the little orange circle, that's roughly where we are geographically. Um, and then the, the images here, this is me in younger days, as it were, um, sitting together with, with Yikura, um, at, uh, that was a meeting we had in, in Botswana, I think. Um, and then we also published a little booklet on, on, on Ochiro, a grammatical sketch, um, and the picture is there on the right. So the, the numbers I was learning was Imwe for one, Imbari for, for two, Indatu for three. If you speak Swahili, Datu, Tatu, you can see that these languages are related. Um, and then the tens and the twenties and the hundreds. But then I also learned 1904. Um, uh, sorry, there is a um, ambulance passing the house. Um, Muvyunaine, uh, that is 1001 and 109 and 4. So then, why was I learning 1904? It seemed slightly random. Um, but there actually was a very good reason for it. And that is, um, it's not 1904, 1904, 1904. It's, it's a number which is, which is the, the, it's a year which is inscribed in Herero cultural memory. So on the 11th of August in 1904, it's the date of what is called the Battle of the Waterberg. The Waterberg, that's the, the mountain you see there top right. Um, and that's when the German colonial troop, uh, South, you know, Namibia was Southwest Africa at the time, so German, uh, under German colonial rule. Um, and the German troops began the, what is called the Herero War. 
or it, or the Kaiser's Holocaust. There's a very good um, historical reconstruction of that uh, by Olu Soga and Ericsson. I can I can share the reference. Um, unraveling that, but it was a very brutal and very vicious onslaught, really on on the whole of the of the Hill community, um, and that has been really very important for his for Hill history and, and cultural history. So, so this number is really important in the cultural context. So, what that means is that numbers refer to dates, and dates often then change the destiny of the people. So, 1904 for in the Hill context. It's a bit like 1066, maybe if that means something to like you know, the, the, the Norman invasion in English cultural history, or 9-11 more recently, the, the Twin Towers, or if in a, in a Chinese context, 1949, the Communist Revolution, these numbers mean something. They're not just numbers. And by learning them and engaging with them with the language, you have, it's an entry point. It says, these are entry points to different semantic and cultural networks. Um, and so you can see on the right hand side, that's the Waterberg, and this is the page on the little grammatical sketch we did, where we also have the, the little note on the on the 1904. Um, good. Um, so that brings us to language learning, African languages at source. We have six African languages, four currently running, Amharic, Swahili, Yoruba, and Zulu. Um, at undergraduate and master level, um, sometimes you will be together with both levels. Um, we, we aim to integrate language study into disciplines, so it's not, not self-standing, but it interacts with other things you do. Um, the languages are entry points to culture and literature in the way we've just seen. Um, we also think language study and language research is part of a wider decolonizing agenda. It's, it's you know, if you accept that people speak different languages and to learn these languages, you have a much better, better way of talking to them at the same level, if you like. Um, and, and African languages also as a commitment to African values and multilingual practices. So there's a you know, political value to that as well. Um, that was it on the slide. Thank you very much. Asanteni from Swahili. There's these are little impressions from SOAS. I'm going to stop sharing the slides now. Um, I hope that gave you an impression about the academic discourses we have. Um, if you're happy with that, um, there is a question that we can have a little question. I think we're okay. Um, there's a question from Daniela. Um, is African studies languages offered at both undergraduate and postgraduate? Also, would you say it's harder to learn language, especially one as Swahili, as a degree and also as older teenager? So Africans, African studies as a, as a program is offered at master level. So there's an MA African studies. At undergraduate level, the, the program in which it's embedded is called BA Languages and Cultures. Um, or indeed, you can learn African languages in other in you know in other degrees. So you know, I think any source degree actually allows you to take African languages. Um, but the but the degree in which maybe maybe these things I talked about are, are contextualized. That's the um, BA um, BA languages and cultures, and that has the African language stream in it. Um, at the moment, with four African languages, hopefully, you can get the six uh, languages back up running. Um, is Swahili difficult to learn? I don't know. Actually, that's a good question. I have a little bit of you know, practice, I, you know, yes, we have, we have a few minutes and I'm just going to share that. So you get a sense of whether you think it's difficult or not. Um, and then, um, you know, Alice can actually talk better about that than I can, but I'll show you the, one of the textbooks we use. Um, I don't quite know why, where we are, where we are. I want to be here, we go. I'm so sorry, here. Um, so this is a book, it's called Colloquial Swahili. Um, and this is actually an older edition, but that doesn't matter. So, so our language learning and teaching is quite interactive. So it's communicative language. You learn grammar, but it's really also about building vocabulary, being able to use the language. Um, so this is quite hands-on, if you like. Um, and it would be things like this. So this is a short dialogue. Um, Nick Brown, a German consultant working for the Tanzania Zambia Railway Company, Tazara, and Kathy Houston, an American overseas student, are both based in the Tanzanian city of Dar es Salaam. The two visitors have decided to take a short break from work and study to go to Zanzibar Island, 50 miles from the coast of Dar es Salaam. After arriving by ferry, they are now approaching the Harbor Customs Office. And if you've done that, it's quite an ordeal. It, you know, there, there's lots of commotion, lots and lots of people, and you have to get your passport stamped by these authorities. And it's sometimes a bit difficult to find the office, but, but it's also, it's entertaining in a sense, because everybody's quite good natures about it. So, um, so this is the situation we are. And then Kathy says, Hodi, which means, I, I wish to enter, really. That's what it means on entering a room. You say, Hodi, can I, can I come in? And the custom officer says, Karibu, meaning you're welcome. Yes, please come in. Kathy says, Asante, Habari, Thank you. How are, you. how are your news? How are you? 
And the customer officer says, Zuri, I'm fine. Karibuni. Karibuni means you're welcome to two people because it's both Nick and Kathy. So the custom officer says, Karibu first, just hearing the knock, and then Karibuni with a knee at the end to two people. Um, Kathy next say, Asante, a thank you to the customs officer. Um, the customs officer asked, Ham Jumbo, are you okay? How are you both? The reply to that is, Hatu Jumbo. Then Nick asked, Now, Wewe, and you? Who Jumbo, Buana, how are you? Buana, meaning Mr. The customs officer says, Mimi si Jumbo, I'm, I'm fine. I don't, there's nothing wrong with me. I'm okay. Habari Zenu, how is your news? The two of you. And Kathy and Nick then say, in Zuri, our news is fine. And even if it wasn't fine, you really have to say, I'm okay, before you then can say, actually, there's some issue. Um, you probably have come across, across Jumbo. That's quite famous. There's little song, Jumbo Buana. And also, um, I think the Lion King has some Swahili words. So this is, some of it might be familiar. Um, but, um, so this is the translation. We've just seen that. Um, I can briefly show you a little exercise. Do and this is, I mean, this is like the first uh, first lesson, so that's at the beginning. Um, but this is about the talking to one and talking to many. So this is, um, ah, sorry, um, there's a question in chat. I can do that quickly. Is Swahili course available for students BSc International Relations Politics? I, I, I wouldn't quite bet my life on it, but close to, I should think, yes, but that's easy to find out. That's uh, all the all our um, programs should have a language language option in them. So you should be able to do this Swahili as, as in the international relations as well. Um, and then, so you have like example, you know, the exercises like that. So the question is, it's, this is about Karibu and Asante. And what we're after here is speaking to one and speaking to many. If, it, if you talk to one person, you say Karibu and Asante. So Karibu means you're welcome. Asante means thank you. But if you spoke to, speak to many people, you have to put the knee in the end. So in the first example, the customs officer says to Nikki, Nick and Kathy, two of them, Karibuni. So the, the question is, Swali Sasani, what is the answer? What do Nick and Kathy say to the customs officer? Anybody wants to put that in the chat? The, the, the key here, so they, they're going to say thank you, essentially, but the key is that they are speaking to one person rather than to many. So the, aha, thank you, Derek, Asante, thank you, Asante. So Asante is the answer because it's one person. Now, the second one is Nick and the customs officer say, um, and the customers say, uh, so say Karibu to Kathy, and Kathy says to both of them, what does she say? Uh, Asante, thank you. Very good, because Nick and the customs officers are, Two people. Three, Kathy says Karibuni, because Nick and the customs officers are two. And then Nick and the customs officers say to Kathy. Ah, please help me. They say to Kathy, Kathy is one person. And they would say to her. Uh, for you guys, you think it's, it's, it's not fast enough. Uh, just bear with me. Um, Karibuni, Yani, um, um, Nick, and the customer for say to Kathy, one person. Ah, it is Asante. Sorry, sorry, sorry. No, 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 no. I think you're, you know, maybe this is too complicated. Asante is perfectly fine because, because they talk to one person. Yani Kathy says Karibuni because Nick and the customs officer are two, me. But then they say to her Asante because she is one person. So it's, 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 it's about how many people you're addressing, not how many people you are. So in four, Kathy and the customs officer, there's two of them. They say Karibu, one, because they say it to Nick and Nick is only one. But then Nick in return says what to Kathy and the customs officer? Because Nick is now talking to two people.
Ah, qui est Ara Ah, plural of Asante Yani, Asante Ni. Um, so, <clears throat> so this is what we had, I think, in two already. Um, and then the final one, five, is Kathy, Nick, and the customs officer say Karibu to you in this case. And then you reply to them. And if, if you, know, you are, you know, yeah. So you are addressing Kathy, Nick, and the customs officer. So that's many people. And that is as Asanteni with the knee at the end because it's one to three people. So if I'm if I'm talking to one of you, I say Asante, but because it's many of you, it's Asanteni. Asanteni was the form I had at the end of the slide because I assumed this morning that there will be a group of you. Um, good. I think I should stop here because we have 10 minutes left. Um, for questions and answers. Um, so I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Um, and now we are back. Um, ah, there's both a chat and a QA. Um, a question from Chelsea. Um, is Swahili course available for students? Yeah, oh, sorry, that's sorry that it was both in the chat and the QA. I think the answer to that is yes, um, but we can follow that up. I can make a little note. Um, and Chelsea, if actually what I'll do, answer live. Um, I'm, I don't want to answer it live, I stopped that. Um, what I'll do is I'll go to the chat because I want to put my details. I'll put in the chat my email. Um, and then um, if you have questions afterwards, please get in touch and we can have an, an email conversation. Um, and I also double check about the, the politics, thing, but I'm fairly certain that that should be possible. Um, if you have other questions, please either use the um, QA or the chat. Um, and otherwise, I wonder whether, Alice, maybe we can briefly go to you and if you could talk a little bit about your experience, um, that would be helpful as well. We've got one question that's just come in just before sure. we go to Alice. Um, they've asked, how is the translation project for third years like? Ah, very good, very good. So again, Alice, probably, you know, you can talk about it, but um, it's typically, it, it's, it's both small, smaller texts, and then sometimes also people work on longer texts. So um, so I'm, I'm very sorry, actually, there's a, there's a very esteemed colleague of ours, Ida Hachivayanis, she is teaching a lot of Swahili, uh, but she is unwell today, so she can't be with us. But she has just finished, or last year finished, translating um, Alice in Wonderland, you know, the, the Lewis Carroll one. And you can imagine because Alice in Wonderland plays a lot with language. You know, there's, there, there's the scene where somebody says, oh, you know, whenever I say something, it means that and that it means. So it's a real challenge. So she can talk a lot about the, the intricacy of translating that into Swahili. But her translation really has been, has been quite popular and famous and people really like it. Um, so there's long tradition of, of people doing, doing translation work here. And we have a very strong center for translation studies as well. The other project we do actually, it's very different. We are translating an, an app, which is called FarmSmart, um, which is an app to give information about agriculture type things, you know, which crops to use and which fertilizers and how rain works. I'm, I'm not a farmer myself, but, but that, that uh, an app was developed in English and we had a big project translating that into Swahili. So that would be a much more, if you like, applied translation. So it depends a little bit, it's project-based, uh, but it's, it's fairly hands-on in that there will be translation you know, exercises and practice to, throughout the module. And we also just appointed actually a professor of practice, uh, Wanguri Wangorosh, who is also translating, you know, she is a language activist, but also a translator. Um, so she also contributes to that as well. Um, and then we can check on the website. It should tell you how the how the how the um, module is assessed. I, I I'm not sure whether it's one translation or smaller bits, um, but I wonder whether Alice knows that actually. Um, I'm doing the module like Swahili translation. I don't know if that's what you're talking about. I'm sorry. Mm, I think so. Yes. What's like? Okay. <laughs> yes, that's what I'm doing. Sorry? Is it enjoyable? It's great. Ida is an amazing teacher. Yes, she, she really makes it enjoyable. She really, well, Ida's amazing at teaching any, um, both all of the subjects she teaches. 
Um, she just has such passion for Swahili and translation. And she has lots of anecdotes from when she translated Alice in Wonderland um, about how it all works. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. um. Um, I can talk a bit about languages and African studies if you want now as well. <laughs> so, as I said, I'm third year BA African Studies, which is now lang BA Language and Culture. Um, so at SOAS, I have studied both Amharic and Swahili. So I did Amharic two, and then I've done Amha um, Swahili one, two, and three, now in the third year, and also doing Swahili translation. Um, I really enjoyed Swahili. I really enjoyed both languages. I really love Amharic and I love Swahili. I know someone asked earlier in the chat if Swahili was hard. Something that really bugs me about Swahili is every time you say you're studying it, everyone's like, oh, that's a really easy language, isn't it? Um, and I don't find it particularly easy. <laughs> um, but like every language, it's really like what you put into it is what you get out of it. And there's definitely a lot of resources at SOAS. So like at SOAS, you have students from all across the world. So you'll definitely find people to practice with. And there are different resources. Oh, I've forgotten what it's called, but there's something where you can talk to someone who speaks your language online. And so I spend a couple sessions. Um, what else is I going to say? Oh, yeah. So as part of my degree, I was meant to have a year abroad in my third year. So it was meant to be a four year degree. Unfortunately, that didn't happen due to Corona. Um, but I would def definitely recommend looking into that if that's something you're interested in. Um, I did it myself. So I'm now because everything's online. I'm doing it from Kenya and, and I was in Tanzania. Um, so it's a great space to practice. And I know people that have been on the year abroad in previous years, not just to East Africa, but different year abroads with different courses and they like loved it so much. Um, and it's really beneficial. You get to know the community and like definitely practice your language skills so much. Um, what literature does the course cover? I don't know if that's for me, but I can answer that. Um, Derek, um, so I did a module last year, which I definitely recommend called um, what was it called? Wow. Anyway, I was like, wait, I just wrote it to my friend. Look, la, um, oh my God. Okay, never mind. Um, it's called like um, African literature or something like that. And you cover so many different books and it's really amazing. And I was just talking to my friend about it, about how your readings for each week aren't as she would quote, like boring political readings, you get to read like a, a novel and read um, literature about written by an African author and it's really enjoyable. So there's like different modules you can do on literature. You can even do, I'm guessing ones from other courses with your open modules. You doesn't have to do, like even if you're studying African studies or something very specific, you'll probably have open modules. So you can look at literature and languages from other areas of the world. Um, yeah, does anyone have any other questions? I, I think there's about two that. that's come in that are very similar. Um, how does learning a language in a pan, what's learning a language in a pandemic like and how has COVID impacted the course? So if either of you want to take those. So you know, I can I can say briefly and then Alice, you can come in. So so in, I think, so all, all our teaching has moved online. And my experience with that has been quite good, actually. So what I've done, not so much in the languages, but in the, in the thematic courses, um, I have, and actually in the languages, I think people do that as well. We have a pre-recorded lecture. So I record the lecture and that's available and anybody can watch it at any time. And students really like it because A, they can pause or you know come back to it, have a cup of coffee in between. And, and you can do it whenever you like. So you don't have problems also with time zones or with work schedules, carrying responsibilities. You know, so your social life is, is completely fine. And then, so it's a by and that's an hour recorded lecture, and then we have an hour interactive seminar. And that's so that's also online, but it means that really there's a lot of student input. So, so typically, there might be like, like you know, some, some worksheets, some data we look at, or some discussion points. Um, and then there's maybe breakout groups, people go in smaller groups, come back plenary. Um, and that has worked very, very well for me. Um, and there's also the assessment, there's, there's mitigation. So you know, for the exams, there are now open book exams. So you can take them at home. And I think you have like a day or two to answer the, the questions. Um, so on, on balance, I think it works well. Um, for the year abroad, we have to see whether we can run that. Um, but what Alice mentioned, we, we have an arrangement. We try to set that up again with a charity called Chatterbox. Um, and that, that is you know, group sessions with speakers of the language. And that's also quite exciting because these are not language teachers. These are, you know, they, historically they were migrants, refugees. 
um, people in this country. So, and now it's, it's broader, but essentially these are people from all walks of life. And it's really, really interesting to, to meet them. It's a little bit like a small year abroad in an, in an online environment. Um, Alice, do you want to, want to follow up on the COVID online? No, I agree with what you're saying. Um, definitely, it's really great being able to watch the lectures like I don't have any lecturers that do pre-recorded ones but they are all recorded so you can watch them after and you can go back to them if you're writing an essay you can be like oh what did they say and all that stuff it's definitely it's definitely really great that it's recorded um yeah mm. I found it okay in the pandemic uh lovely we've got like one more minute if there's any more questions that are going to come through if not, um, like Professor Lutz said, he's put his email down if you want to contact him after the session for any questions that you might have. Mm -hmm. And I've also just put the link to the language for lockdown. It's, I mean, we did, I think we did that last May or something. It's a bit old, but it's still fun to click through. And there's two Swahili things. I'm not sure if there's, uh, you might have an Amharic as well, um, but there's lots of other, other source languages as well. But yes, I mean, you know, that, um, um, as Amani has said, please be in touch if you have questions. Um, and also, you know, if I think we run more open days in the next couple of months, um, because I think um, Ida, our Swahili lecturer, will, she will be back as well. And there's Bukola as well. Uh, she is West Africa, Yoruba specialist, literature specialist. Um, Josef does um, Amharic. So actually, it's a much bigger team. It's just today we are, you know, to me, Shikwa na 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 You know, people are unwell. There was different planning issues. So, um, so that's why people couldn't make it. But if you come to the next one, which I think there's a series of them, um, I'm sure you will meet other people as well. And you know, everybody I'm sure is happy to talk on the email. Okay, brilliant. Um, I wanna thank everyone for coming, um, for our panelists as well. And I hope this has been a really useful session for everyone. Um, like you said, feel free to contact um, Professor Lutz after. If you have anything about admissions in particular, feel free to reach out to our admissions department and they'll get back to you. But yeah, thank you everyone for attending. Very good indeed. Thank you, Asantini. Bye. <laughs>